Uh, hello, everyone. I'm here today with Andrew, and I'm super excited to introduce Andrew to you and to myself as well, because I don't know him very well, but I know he has, um, has a really fascinating story. And from what I've heard and seen, um, he's experienced a lot of change, a lot of change from from the inside out, from seeing things differently about himself and life. And I'm really excited to, to get to hear about it. So thanks for being here, Andrew. My pleasure, Amy. It's great to meet you. Yeah, yeah, you too. So maybe, um, yeah, just start off by telling us a little bit about um, how things were for you kind of at, at a mm. darker point, you know, and then we'll just sort of take your story from there. Okay, cool. I guess uh, I just sort of, uh, frame this by saying that I, I think I've always been somebody certainly up to about 10 years ago who was at risk of um, depression and I'd experienced I've experienced in my life three kind of what I call major episodes of depression or I'm, by, by major I mean needing medical intervention <laughs> um, so ending up either on or close to being on antidepressants and um, it was just a pattern in my life, really, that kind of seemed to repeat every time there seemed to be a major situational problem or a major crisis in the external circumstances of my life. Uh, and I talk about that external circumstances now because obviously we, we, we can relate that to, to the new understanding that I've um, <laughs> been exposed to. Um, and I suppose the last major episode was 2006 when I actually did find myself um, in a serious condition. I, I was in a psychiatric hospital for five weeks with what's called psychotic depression. And uh, psychotic depression is where the sufferer loses contact with reality. So you imagine all sorts of sounds, sights, tastes and smells that aren't real. And um, really quite frightening, like a, a living nightmare, really, which went on for several weeks. So I didn't sleep. And uh, I was a risk to myself, and uh, I was admitted for my own safety. Um, and I have to say, Amy, it was the lowest point of my life. And the bizarre thing is, I'd only just qualified as a psychologist at this point. Um, and having listened to some of your story and, and some of your material, I kind of <laughs> resonated with some of it. Although I think, you know, clearly quite different circumstances. But um, I knew lots of stuff, but it hadn't kind of helped me. <laughs> <laughs> and consequently, I wasn't really able to help other people as much as I would like to have been able to do at that stage in life. And um, I, was, I was really at a very low end. That was quite honestly the lowest point in my life. So I felt humiliated, embarrassed. Here was I, a father, husband, business owner, qualified psychologist, on my back in a psychiatric hospital, feeling utterly humiliated and embarrassed by the experience, which seemed to have been perpetrated by a challenging set of external circumstances which I now realize really don't have the power to do that but at the time it felt like they did and as I say this wasn't the first time i would had a problem but this was by far the most challenging situation I found myself in and um, through that journey I then realized this was not a pattern I had to repeat and it's begun a process of inquiry and exploration and discovery which has culminated in my um, being exposed to an understanding of principles, uh, as well as a lot of other things which have made a big difference, not least some, some lifestyle changes that I made, um, which I've written about uh, in a book. And um, so I've been fortunate enough to be able to kind of hit the bottom <laughs> and bounce. <laughs> and, and, and from there, there's only one way to go, and that's up, really. <laughs> so that's a very brief version. And I, I'm... And as I say, this was a pattern that had repeated probably at 10 year intervals uh, since I was about 17. Um, so I was 44 at that point when I found my way into hospital in 2005. I'm now 56 and, and life has changed beyond recognition. I now know that that pattern won't repeat. And I think that there was a feeling around and I think sometimes it's, um, it's perpetuated in the professions that if you've had some sort of mental illness, mental condition, you're going to be more vulnerable to it in the future as a result of life circumstances or challenges. And I found that quite unhelpful because, you know, as Sid Banks says, life is a contact sport, stuff happens. And uh, if you think that you're going to be vulnerable the next time a major crisis occurs, you know, you lose your job, somebody close to you dies, something happens, then it, it's, life is going to be very challenging. And um, so, as I say, I, I now realise the truth of that, that uh, that's not the sort of situation that I need to keep repeating. 
in my life. Wow, that's great. I, it's a, I love when the stories are extreme. And like you said, it's like a, such a bottom because, and that you can now, and you know, it's been a while, but that you can now see that as a blessing that you could hit that and start to move up from there. Cause it's the only place you could really go <laughs> from there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think uh, it was a blessing. And the, and the bigger part of the blessing is that I'm now able to help other people. Uh, as a result of having had that experience myself and that that feels well very powerful and and very it made sense of the whole thing from a sort of life purpose point of view really yeah so how um how did you go from being discharged from the from the hospital after your seven weeks or whatever it was five weeks five weeks yeah to, like how did it go from there to where you well started? it certainly wasn't a sort of beautiful trajectory <laughs> <laughs> I, I was i was on antidepressant medication two types actually i was on antipsychotics and antidepressants for 18 months and one of the problems with that was i put on a lot of weight uh, as i was told to expect which isn't great for your mood anyway right. i put on um 50 pounds uh, in, in US currency or uh, three and a half stone 22 kilos in European currency and um, that really made me feel kind of worse in some ways although it was kind of superficially dealing with some of the symptoms it wasn't getting to the root causes and by this time I'd found myself in, a, in an international global training role I was, I was traveling all over Europe and the world running training courses quite high pressure and the the medication kind of helped to mask my, my symptoms to this I could do that job but I, I felt very vulnerable and uh, and, and even before that you know I kind of come out of the hospital in a quite fragile state and I've gone to stack shelves in my local supermarket just to get out into the world again that was how serious it was I, I couldn't face anybody I couldn't face the world and I realized that I had to sort of start to do this gradually. I had to gradually expose myself to the things that frightened me. Because one of the challenges with depression is you literally just want to hide away. You want to hide away from the world, which is kind of the worst thing you can do because that isolation um, exacerbates the situation or the condition. So once the medication did start to have an impact, I could start to, 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 to get out there and be a bit more social again. As I say, I got a I've got a full-time job um, but then it wasn't dealing with the underlying causes and the weight gain and other side effects convinced me that actually I had to look for something else a more natural approach which wasn't going to leave me vulnerable to uh, mental illness or depression for the rest of my life which was not a, a place I wanted to, to be operating from. So was your understanding at that point that um this this depression thing was a was something that you were very prone to and that when life got hard you know there was a great chance you were going to dip back in because that had been your your history yeah that was my history uh once at school just after a very challenging set of school of, of public examinations um once with a profession change in profession where i i kind of felt I'd failed and then the third time with this problem that I, uh, I encountered, which was actually quite a severe business problem, but I certainly didn't need to react to it in the way that I did. And, th and as I say, that created the sense that, you know, I was dependent on life circumstances going well for my well-being. And, and none of us can be dependent on that. Life is up and down, as we all know. Stuff happens. And um, I have to say the understanding that I've come across since, and as I say, the lifestyle changes that I put in place, which incidentally were initially around losing that weight, um, three and a half stone overweight, I felt uh, old beyond my years, I felt uncomfortable, I felt at risk of major illness, heart attacks, diabetes, cancer, strokes, all of that stuff. And I, that was the initial motivation to start looking around, which, which is where I came across the, the material which found its way into my book uh, called Fit for Business, How to Deal with Stress and Create Healthy Work-Life Balance. Because not only did I find a way to lose weight very effectively in a healthy way, I'd also uh, I was mitigating the effects of stress and I literally increased my stress threshold um, quite significantly by making these lifestyle changes. So that felt Absolutely. great. Um, but that on its own wasn't enough because I was still experiencing kind of mental turmoil. And uh, I guess it was about 2012 when somebody put a copy of Michael Neal's Inside Out Revolution in my hands and said, you need to read this. 
Um, I thought, okay, yeah. I, you know, this was a friend who knew something about my story and, and had already been exposed to principles. And I read Michael's book and I probably got about 15% of it, Amy. And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting, but it hasn't changed my life yet. And then over the next couple of years, people kept putting books into hands. <laughs> Jack Pransky, somebody should have told us. Um, George Pransky's Relationship Handbook. Um, some of Jamie Smart's work. And, and I just thought, okay, right, I need to pay attention to this. And then about 18 months ago, it clicked. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized the power of this understanding. And, and I think for me, there were a couple of touch points in that, and I'll articulate them quickly. One was that, as I said, I had psychotic depression, which is literally a version of reality, what was a living nightmare. And I knew I'd created it, by the way, but it was so compelling, I was literally in hell. Um, but I knew that I created it. And that is so consistent with the principles. So once I'd made that link, between what the principles talk about with creating our own reality and the, the, the living hell reality that I'm creating through psychotic depression. But okay, bang, got it. I'm in. <laughs> um, and then it was also the sense, as I said before, that I'd always felt vulnerable to another episode of depression or mental illness brought on by life circumstances. And that blew, the, under, the, the principles understanding blows that out of the window. It's, it's not a possibility. <laughs> Uh, and that feels, those two particular insights and understandings were what convinced me this, this was such a powerful way of, of, of being, um, which we all have, as we know, from, from when we come out of the womb. Um, but I'd lost touch with as, as have other people. So that was kind of the, 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 the pivotal point, the two pivotal points. Really. So when you, um, even before when you were in this psychotic depression, you had a sense of kind of knowing that you, it was being created. I mean, you knew you weren't in reality just by your label and your, what people well, were Well, do you know what? I believed my thinking. Um, I've subsequently come to realize. And the funny thing is when I came out of hospital, I wrote it down. I wrote down what I'd been thinking, how I'd been feeling. And to read it back, it, it is like, reading somebody else's words because it was so graphic I, I literally believe that there was a world conspiracy uh, to destroy me financially uh, it was a, a paranoia and 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 it, it sounds crazy but that was an invention um in my own mind through non-stop negative thinking 24 hours a day seven days a week and and the power of that negative thinking spiral literally as i say took me from a fully functioning husband father and business owner to a, a a suicidal wreck now you know if if i ever needed a, a, a convincing that the power of thought is is as strong as it is that was it for me and and that's where i ended up so so how was it like, like when you were, as you're reading about this and hearing, oh yeah, we feel our thinking and we create our experience with our thinking and you're thinking back to, oh yeah, I know that because I've had these huge range of experiences, right? Bigger than the average range. Like, I don't, I know it's hard to put words around this sometimes, but was there like a, a moment where it really started to sink in or just kind of a gradual thing where you were like, wow, okay, because of well, these brief experiences, I really see yeah. I know. I'd, I'd love to say that there was a great sort of clash of thunder and the heavens opened and I saw it. I don't think it did happen that way. It's a gradual percolation. But I think those two points that I articulated, you know, this connection of the principles explained with my creation of psychotic depression and the way that that was entirely thought generated. I mean, for example, I can remember waking up one morning at my mother's house and I didn't recognize her. Um, or my stepfather, or my father, the only person I recognized was my wife. I believe they were all imposters. And, and yet, so that there was a part of me that was still in this world, and there was a part of me that had gone somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and, and that was the day when I was admitted to hospital, because as I say, I'd become a danger to myself, and I would have willingly killed myself, given an opportunity, which is a crazy thing to say now. It was just a thought. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that suicidal thought would have been it, would have been enough at that point in my life. I would have carried through with it. Um, and as I say, luckily, the drugs then gave me a break from that psychotic reality, but they didn't help me get to the root causes of my uh, suffering, 
which is what I've subsequently been able to realise through a combination of health and lifestyle and uh, the principles. Yeah, it's it's just amazing, um, like the, you know, to hear your story and then just to say, well, what you were going through is just an extreme version of what we all live in. And that's what I talk about. Yeah, I just had a particularly exaggerated version of it. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel blessed for that because it, it convinced me beyond, beyond any doubt that this is true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, and I love that in terms of the, um, like your other kind of big insight even of seeing, okay, I'm, I'm going to potentially su succumb to this over and over in my life, you know, that no, all it is is, it, you know, we all succumb to it <laughs> every day, all the time, really. And, and, I, and I still do in, in very mild form, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> That's what I just said. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah, you will, but then, I mean, when it's that extreme, all the thinking comes in and, it, you know, and it just, it, it just kind of can carry you away. But now it's like it's that same process of yes. thought coming to life consciousness bringing it to life in such a realistic way that we don't really know that we're even thinking in those moments yeah. and then thought changing you know and yeah. seeing that there's like that that health beneath the whole system because clearly if you can go from that to fully fun back to fully functioning and how you are now you know i mean that speaks so much to the to the health and the resilience that had been in you the whole time. Oh. You know, it, it, and it's very humbling, actually, to know that we all have this and we forget. And, and this is the rope that we can throw to other people who are kind of in distress. And, you know, I talk to people regularly who are kind of tottering on the edge of where I was. And, and it's such a privilege to be able to say this doesn't have to be the pattern of your life, as, as you were able to do, too. You were very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. So early on, you said... Um, you know now that that cycle will never happen again. Yeah. How, say more about that. Like, I can imagine <laughs> somebody at home like, well, how can you know oh, that? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, two things. One, uh, uh, there's a sort of preventative maintenance component to my life. So a bit like you would service a car. <laughs> so you change the oil every so often. You look after the tires. You make sure that it's safe to take on long runs. I have to say, I look after my well-being. Uh, physiologically and I think that's important I mean at 56 years of age I don't want to have a, a slow decrepit decline to old age I, I actually want to live a vibrant life being able to do all the things I can now do till the very end and that's entirely possible with, with you know with what I've discovered and learned and now put into practice and there's books out there called you know younger next year how to turn back your biological clock there's all sorts of fascinating stuff on simple lifestyle choices that we can make and um that, that's hugely profound. And I say that was all I had for the first few years after 2006. But in a sense, that, that, that was a good start. But it didn't give me the confidence that I would be able to withstand the storms of life going forward, which is where the principles have come in. And the, the, the clear understanding and the truth that it's not my external circumstances that have any power and control over me. Um, and therefore, knowing the, the, the truth that I'm, I'm creating my thinking, living my thinking, experiencing my, my world through my thinking, um, takes away that pressure. And let me give you a quick metaphor. We all love metaphors in this community, don't we? Here's mine. <laughs> I was at something called the Festival of Speed in the southern part of England about six months ago. And this is a, um, a, a petrol heads paradise, as we would call it in the UK. So it's full of fast cars and all sorts of exciting things. I'm a bit of a, a fast car enthusiast. And um, I went into this exhibit. It was called the Back to the Future Tent. And in that uh, tent, there was a virtual reality roller coaster. And I could see, as I lined up in the queue for this, about 12 people strapped into seats, having this compelling experience with headsets, with earpieces, uh, the seats were moving slightly. They were terrified for their lives on this roller coaster. And yet, I knew that they were straight, safely strapped into a tent in the festival speed. So I thought, well, this is going to be an interesting experience. So as my turn came, I thought, right, I'm just going to, I'm going to throw myself into the virtual reality and experience it. And it was terrifying. But at the same time, I'm going to flip flop out into the truth that I'm perfectly safe, strapped into a seat in the tent. And it was incredibly em empowering. And I realized, again, that, you know, through this, this kind of metaphor, but through a real experience that, uh, you know, I could go with the virtual reality or I could know the truth that I was perfectly safe 
my life was not in jeopardy. And I use that metaphor quite a lot with people because, you know, this, this concept that, that life is, is a virtual reality experience of our own creation was hard for me to understand, A, until I got psychotic depression, but B, until I really understood um, what the principles were pointing to in that area. That's such a great metaphor. You know, I mean, it's just such a vivid one because the thing is, like you were, like you said, you were fully in it when you were in it. I mean, you still yeah. were, were terrified in that experience knowing what you knew. And it's not like you had to sit there and remind yourself, okay, this is just a ride or this is just an illusion, you know, but but you kind of came in and out of it. And that, that's... Yeah. And it was, it was really fun. It was really fun to do. And, and, and I urge anybody who gets a chance to do a virtual reality experience, try it out. Because I think it's, it's you know, it's very compelling virtual reality. And yet we are all doing it all the time through the power of mind, consciousness of thought, as you say. And, and, and sometimes we just need to appreciate that because we kind of become conditioned to believe that we feel our circumstances. And I believe that for, for pretty much uh, most of my life. Um, and, and that's what made me think that I was always at risk. And that's not great. It's not a great way to live your life. It's a very anxiety provoking way to walk through life because it is things need to happen a certain way and we know we're not in control of what happens. Yeah. No. And, and, and uh, yeah, for me, it was money. Um, very briefly, I'll tell the story. It's, it's in the book, but I bought a property in the Southern part of Cyprus in 2005 when the market was at its peak. Um, Cyprus was in the European Union. It was just about to go into the Euro. Um, it was one of those things that everybody was pining into. And I thought, well, how hard can this be? So I went on a two-day course to learn how to invest in property, went over to Cyprus, bought a property. And within four months of buying the property, the market dropped 25%. So my mortgage was now into negative equity. I now owed more than the value of the property. I couldn't rent it. And then Cyprus went into the euro at a very strong rate. So the mortgage payments doubled. So basically, I had a, a hole that I was shoveling money into. Now, that's happened to a number of people. You know, the, 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 you, we've had sort of property crises in the past many times. Unfortunately, I'd committed to a big mortgage. I'd kind of wrote my wife in, said this would be great, won't it? And, 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 and felt such a fool to the extent, as I say, I literally beat myself up night and day um, for my own in my own words, stupidity, to the point where I, I couldn't function anymore. Now, that sounds crazy when I relay it. And that is a sort of almost day-to-day -day problem that anybody could have. And actually, as I've outlined in the book, I've, I've handled far, far bigger financial challenges since with the understanding that I now have. So this, this is why I know this works. Because <laughs> on my pure, small empirical sample, um, what I've handled has far outweighed what, what, what threw me into the abyss in 2006. Yeah, so it can't be that. No, it's certainly, it's certainly not that. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that too because, yeah, I mean, again, that's another really vivid example. And I'm sure people listening will think, oh, God, that sucks. <laughs> that, mm. you know, that would be really scary and it would bring up all kinds of emotion. And, and, and yet there's a way in which like we're all sort of in things like that and it's not about that thing so like no. you, know, you talk to somebody who who ended a relationship and now they regret it and they can sit there and beat themselves up in a similar way that you were and just keep absolutely it yeah like, i can't believe i did this or i can't believe i did that or invested here or you know so it's like and it's not there's not this clear tie with the magnitude of it Sometimes it's the things that other people look at and say, well, that's not that big a deal. But in your exactly. mind, because we just feel the way it comes to life for us, it really doesn't. Oh, oh this is the thing. You put your finger on it, Amy. The way that came to life for me was the biggest challenge I'd ever faced. And I, I felt I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it to the point where I just crumpled. Now, you know, that's classic resilience. And, and yet, actually, it wasn't that that was causing me to have these horrible feelings and this psychosis uh, and, and not be able to sleep for three months. It was, it was the, the thinking, in other words, the self-flagellation and, the, and the, the, yeah, the, that whole thing, beating myself up. And we all occasionally run the risk of doing that. Um, but it's so unhelpful because it, it literally just adds to the mental clutter and certainly doesn't help you through the, the problem-solving part of whatever you've got to deal with. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I love too about this understanding is it just becomes it, you know, we still are going to think and we're still going to get caught up in thinking, but it's almost like that, that way that we bounce out of it or that we see the illusion. We see that we're on the virtual reality ride, you know, like that's just that much closer. So like when you said, cause I know that kind of when people hear that, they're going to say like, wow, like when you've said early on, like, I know this, you know, I know I'm not going to fall into this again in that way. Now you can still feel depressed thinking. You can oh, yeah. still feel depressed. You can still have psychotic thoughts, but yep. like, would you say that it's like, there's a, there's a deeper knowing that now keeps you kind of closer to the surface. There's a deeper knowing. And, and it also feels like there's a safety net. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, my natural uh, resilience, wisdom, insight, understanding will catch me. So I never have to free fall again. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that does feel really good. And, and as I say, I talk to people who are not there at the moment, who are really struggling. And, 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 and I'm saying this will be your turning point. This, this could be the best thing that's happened to you because not only will you get insights and understanding, you'll be able to throw a rope to other people and help them. And, and it's very hard to talk to somebody who's kind of at the bottom rooting around um, without hope. Um, but c having come back from that, I, I do feel very positive. And unfortunately, and as a psychologist, and, and you're a psychologist too, I, I, was, I was kind of disappointed by the inability of the profession to deliver on some of these things. Because if I'm absolutely honest, one of the reasons why I went into psychology was to kind of fix myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe I could help fix other people once I'd sorted that big one out. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and as I say, the, the irony is, you know, this all happened to me a year after I qualified. So nothing I'd read or studied or taken exams on had equipped me to deal with what came up. And there's such a, I, me too. I mean, that is this very similar path for me. And it, like, I see that too as well at this point. Like, there's such a perfection in that. It was mm. like, I think on some level that added like, like, oh my gosh, and what I've just learned, you know, isn't helping me. And that just kind of oh, adds yeah. to, the big, you know, despair. But yeah. then there is, there's such a perfection because then like that safety net swoops in and you hit a bottom and then you learn something better, you know, and it's, yeah. It's the elegance of life, isn't it? And yet at the time it feels like the worst thing that's ever happened. And there were some consequences, you know, I mean, my marriage didn't survive it, so my children were sort of 10 and eight at the time. So I spent you know, less time with them subsequently. Um, but you know, you, you just have to, uh, you have to suck it up sometimes. And, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't change things now, quite frankly, um, that experience uh, profound and horrific though it was, has given me such a positive uh, approach to, uh, to life and, and to, to thinking about you know, what, what happens when life gets tough. Uh, it doesn't just have to be a, a, an automatic reaction, a subconscious response, which is kind of where I've been for much of my life. It's so great. I love your story. It's so um, inspirational, really. I mean, and it's just, it's so hopeful for people to hear. Well, that's why I like to share it. And do you know, the, t the thing is, um, Amy, I hadn't shared it until May last year publicly. Friends and family, close friends and family knew, but I was too embarrassed and humiliated. And I went back to my old school. I'm, I'm a, a student of the school that Shakespeare went to in uh, Stratford on Avon. So I was invited back. Somebody found me on LinkedIn. They invited me to do the speech at the annual reunion. And I opened the speech with this, the quote from Hamlet There's nothing good or bad, only thinking makes it so. It's a longer quote than that, I know. But, and I'd heard it several times, but I hadn't really got it. And yet, Shakespeare knew this. He knew this profound truth. So why wasn't it in the exams that I'd taken in the very room where I was giving the speech, which incidentally was the room where Shakespeare learned to read and write. So it kind of closed the circle for me. And at that point, I thought, this is now public. <laughs> yeah. So did you, did you um, tell your story? Did I did. I shared my story. And in fact, the, the, the recording of that speech is on my website at andrewbridgewater.com. So people can kind of hear me share it for the first time with a group of people going, mm. um, <laughs> and I had, I had them do a little experiment, which you've been listening to in the talk, which kind of proves that the power of thought uh, in the room and, and create a little bit of fear in the room <laughs> through a, a sort of little vignette that I played out. But 
yeah, at that point, I thought actually not to share this is selfish because it's not about me anymore. It's about helping people through that experience that I've had. And you start to see in this, and I, I'm sure you have, and I have, that it it's not personal anyway. Like it, it's no. hard to, in the beginning, there is there's shame, and I can't believe I'm talking about this, and it still feels like. I can't believe this happened to me, me, me. But then the more you see about this understanding too, it's like we were saying earlier, this is happening to everybody all the time. It's just cool. different extremes and in different ways, but it's the same thing happening, you know? So that's, that's such a nice feature of this. It's, it's like everything gets less personal and that makes it that much easier to just share. Yeah. You know? Yes. And I think there was a lot of, as I say, humiliation and embarrassment. What would so-and-so think of me? You know, I worked with them 10 years ago. What are they going to think of me if they knew I'd had a nervous breakdown in 2006? Actually, all of that was made up. <laughs> there is still a bit of a stigma about mental illness. And that's part of my rationale for writing the book and talking about this, because I want us to move beyond this. Um, it, it's unhelpful. The stigma is holding people back. And stopping people like me talking about their experience and being able to help others through their experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. And what's the can you say the website again? Andrew Yes, my, my, my website is at andrewbridgewater.com. And this is my book, Fit for Business, How to Deal with Stress and Create a Healthy Work Life Balance. That um, is is primarily about health and lifestyle and the impact that that had for my uh, stress and resilience. But it also does introduce a little bit about the principles. But because I wrote it about 18 months ago, it's not as much principled stuff in there as if I were to rewrite it. And I think there's another book that's gonna need to come forth, <laughs> <laughs> which combines the two because uh, yeah, when you put them together, it's very, very powerful. Yeah, great, great. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Andrew. It was great to hear. My pleasure. And, and thank you for inviting me, Amy. And I'm really glad to have had the opportunity to talk to people. Um, something might have resonated and, and uh, I hope we can, we can both offer some hope. Yeah, definitely. Thank you.